I actually am a, a developer evangelist for Amazon, and that's a really good job, actually, because my job today is to take what we've learned in the Amazon App Store and what I've learned in my own business experience and share that with you when it comes down to power users, or as the rest of you may know them, whales. So why on earth does Amazon think it's in a position to talk about power users and whales? Well, actually, our App Store has a pretty good track record with high-paying users. More of the user base on the Amazon App Store will end up spending money in apps than in any other App Store's customer base. And when they do spend money, they tend to spend a lot more money on apps than users in other App Stores. Now, we're pretty happy about that. But we also wanted to know why. What is it about um, the things that our users do, who they are, that actually helps make them big spenders? So we're going to share that with you today, and we talk about power users, the vital few. Now, one of the things we found out was that power users aren't new to our industry. Power users have been around, well, okay, the first paper I remember reading on this was actually from the late 18. Hundreds. And I mean, you know power users in your own life. Um, when I was a kid, I had friends who followed the Grateful Dead, an old rock band. I think some of you remember the Grateful Dead. Anyone? No? Okay. They were, they were an old band, and friends would follow them on tour every city they'd go to. I have friends now who follow the Seattle Seahawks American football team. Every home game in the U.S., they buy tickets to. Um, this guy is, well, he's really a fan because you don't. Know, Dress like that, unless you have some real love and passion for, for being a fan. And one of the things about people who follow the Grateful Dead football teams and dress like that, they spend a lot of money on things that they love. They have a big emotional connection to whatever it is that, that they're following. And that's uh, a really important aspect of power users that we'll dive into more, is that passion that they feel. And it... Um, uh, it transfers to other things as well, like stamp collecting. A casual user might buy a stamp in every country he visits. A power user is going to go ahead and pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for a misprinted Marilyn Monroe stamp from 1960, right? So these people spend a lot of money. To get kind of the history of that, uh, we're going to go back to that paper I talked about in 1896, I believe it was, when um, uh, Villafred Pareto. <laughs> He's actually a fun guy. He, he, he was looking at his garden and found that 80% of the peas in his garden came from 20% of the pods. And he wanted to, you know, that ratio was kind of intriguing to him. So he looked around and uh, eventually he published a paper saying that 80% of the land in Italy was owned by 20% of the people. His paper was published, yay, and that was pretty much the end of it. Except in 1941, Joseph Duran found this paper, and like any good management consultant, you know what he did? He brushed it off, gave it a really cool name, the Parato Principle, okay, and then he came up with a catchy phrase, uh, the vital few versus the trivial many. And then he went around to all the Fortune 500 companies at the time, telling them that 80% of their revenue is coming from 20% of their users, and what are they doing about it? Well, that message caught on. We all know the 80-20 rule today, the Pareto principle today. And it didn't catch on anywhere better than it did with the casinos, with the gambling industry. And man, did they ever take that to town. And they actually categorized and came up with names for that top 20%, you know, whales and, and dolphins and minnows. Well, it wasn't long before that terminology got translated into what we do as a, as, a, as a software business. And GGV Consulting actually named, uh, made that translation for freemium games. So minnows, of course, are the 97% of people who will never spend any money in our apps. The dolphins are where we can expect about 50% of our revenue. And then, of course, the whales. They're the 2 or 3% of the 3% who pay. So a small percentage of a small percentage. Yeah, so that's less than one-tenth of one percent of all of our users who are going to be those, those whales, those power users. Now, how much revenue exactly you get from your power users? Well, that tends to differ a little bit. 
So Newzoo, um, by the way, I love their data. If you haven't ever looked at a Newzoo data report, uh, go and look at that. They're fantastic. Uh, say that 3.5% of all of the gaming customers generate a third of the revenue. Uh, we've got uh, Google saying that 1% will generate 14% of monthly sales. And Congregate, I love Congregate's data, one-tenth of 1% 1 of their U.S. customers are generating over half of all revenue. So I think it's you know, while the numbers are a little bit different, I think it's pretty easy to say, for the purpose of our conversation, a power user is about 1% of all of your paying customers. That's a tiny little percent, isn't it? That's a tiny fraction of a percent. But they're a pretty important percentage. Now, um, Giraz actually recanted on that whole funny catchphrase he came up with. The vital few are still vital but the many are far from trivial. And he figured out that that 80% actually provides a pretty vital role. One of the things that those 80% do, uh, particularly in the Amazon App Store, they tend to be your advocates. They're the ones who will go out and actually talk about and promote your game or your app. So one, not only do most of your new power users come from this 80%, most of your advocates come from this 80% as well. And had uh, Joseph Giron known anything about the um, uh, ad industry that we work in, he'd have said that these guys are all eyeballs for ad impressions, for ad revenue. And he would never have called them trivial at that point. So, which brings us to why does Amazon not call them whales? Why do we call them power users? When you call someone a whale, it sounds almost... Uh, exploitative. You're like you're trying to exploit some sort of a resource. And what you do is you catch a whale, right? And then you drain all of the resources you can out of the whale until there's nothing left and you throw it back in the ocean and you go after another whale. That's not how Amazon built its business and that's not how we like viewing our customers. We actually prefer the Thomas Lovell spin that he writes about in his book where he talks about different ways of earning revenue. Uh, first of all, the, the model that we really support is getting a ton of money, we don't want anyone not to make money, but get a ton of money because you build something that everybody loves. What you make is so popular, people are just dying to get more of that experience, which is directly opposed to creating some sort of a dependency on your product or your service, either because you produce a product that is chemically and physically addictive or because you create one that's emotionally addictive. And people may want to stop spending, but they can't. Um, that's uh, a little bit less valuable. So we prefer the term power users to refer to the more ethical way of generating business, which brings us to how the power users work in the Amazon App Store. In the Amazon App Store, what they look like is they start, you, you, you cross the line when you start getting $50 a month in spend from a particular user. While that's kind of the barrier to entry for what it takes to be a power user in our store, most of our power users actually spend over $200 a month. And uh, they're focused in the US and Japan, the UK, and Germany. Now, an interesting thing about these people, though, is they don't spread the love evenly. As a matter of fact, these guys are loyal to just about two apps. 80% of the people who spend over $1,000 a month on apps, oh, stop and think about that for a second. $1,000 a month on apps, that's a lot of money to me, okay? But 80% of the people who spend that much money spend most of it on just two apps. That's pretty concentrated spend. Knowing that, does that change how you guys would market your apps? Does that change how you would build or analyze the performance of the games that you guys write? Hold that thought in the back of your head because we're going to come back to that. It's conventional wisdom, or at least it used to be conventional wisdom, that in order to get power users, you needed a massive multiplayer online game. You needed an MMO. Um, it was centuries old wisdom because that actually came from 1997, um, last century. But certainly King dismissed that when they released Candy Crush, and now you've got a casual game really doing well with power users. So the conventional wisdom then said MMO or casual game which then was blown out of the water uh, thanks to Game of War Fire Age because they're neither an MMO nor are they a casual game, but they also did really well with power users. So 
instead of thinking about conventional wisdom whenever you hear about power users, let's focus more on data-driven wisdom, which is what I'm sharing with you today. And it's also why you should care, is because it really impacts the data that, that we work with. Uh, for example, most of us will actually analyze our company's performance or our app's performance based on averages like average revenue per user and average revenue per paying user, right? Does anyone not use that? Yeah, I, I didn't think so. We all use it. And averages are actually pretty useful, particularly when an average fits a standard distribution or a bell curve. Um, examples of things with standard distributions are blood pressure, life expectancy, the number of petals on a flower, and depressing but true, the number of rainy days and cloudy days in Seattle. It also, it, it's close to 100%, but it's still a, a normal distribution around 100%. What doesn't fit a normal distribution is where we get our revenue. That doesn't fit a normal distribution at all. So what I've done here is I've created a power law graph where I've taken people's rank as a payer in the store and matched it against the revenue that they generate for that particular app. Now, when we're talking about disparate data and, and data with a high variance, I'm talking about data points that are really far apart from each other that actually have really different values. So over here we have a very few people that are actually generating a ton of revenue versus uh, quite a lot of people that don't generate much revenue. One of the characteristics of a power law graph that's interesting is that the mean, the average, is pretty much useless. I mean, think about trying to plot an average user on this graph. You're gonna get someone who doesn't actually exist in real life. I mean, if you get the average from this, you can't go up and shake the guy's hand because he's a mathematical construction, not a real human, not a real player in your game. And that can lead to some really bad interpretations of data. Uh, a good example of this is if you're taking a look at how people use the different features in your game and you find a feature that maybe 3% of your customers are using, well, why on earth would you continue to support a feature that's not really popular, right? Kill the feature, work on something else, don't support that feature anymore. Well, unless, of course, it's the one that your power users are using. If all of your power users are the ones using that feature, all of a sudden it goes from being your least important feature to your most important feature. And what you need to be doing is figuring out how you can get the rest of the users in your game funneled into that kind of feature experience so that they can start to experience the great things that are really keeping your power users coming back and spending more money. So understanding how your distribution or your revenue is distributed is super important to analyzing the health and the metrics of your game. Ways that you can do that are prioritizing features by the different monetization segments that you have in your game. What do the 80% like? What do 20% like? What does one tenth of a percent like? You can do this by doing stratified A-B testing. If you're not doing A-B testing already, by the way, because you think some for some reason it's hard, don't. There are about 14 different providers of A-B testing services out there. I think three or four of them are actually free. And the last one I used, I'm serious, it took me 30 minutes to instantiate the service, to create my variables on their website, and then to run a program that would swap out button names in the, the last game that I wrote. So seriously, it's not hard to do A-B testing, and you really should, because it's going to give you data on what your power users really like and what they don't like, and how you can move people from the body of your customer base into payers and into power users. Um, and then certainly impact those workflows that move them along and prioritize those workflows. In nine times out of 10, those features and those workflows will tap on how people feel. It's actually, power users is actually less about a game mechanic than it is how people feel after they finish your game loop. Because think about it, you know, you're being a power user, you're being a super fan, says something about you. I mean, my friends who would follow the band around the country, they didn't do that because they thought the lead singer had nice hair. No, they were huge fans of that experience that they created. Um, my friends today, when they buy a Seattle Seahawks Super Bowl 2014 jersey, it's not because they need a practical reminder of who won the Super Bowl that year. Really, they know already. But they're just so proud of their team. They're part of something bigger. It's an emotional connection that gets them to spend that kind of money. 
So let's take a look at some of the different connections that we've seen people express uh, frequently in the Amazon App Store. One is, think back to the stamps example we looked at earlier. People really like collecting things. Um, maybe it's a nesting instinct. I don't really understand uh, the deep psychology behind that. But boy, collectors really play a valuable role. You see that in some of the card games out there like Hearthstone. And certainly Gameville figured that out in their game, um, uh, Critica, where they have custom avatars that you could actually buy and collect. Now, they're limited edition, so they're going to go away soon. And if you're a collector and you're looking at something that may not be available in a little bit, yeah, you want to have the complete set. So you're going to spend money on it and you're going to buy it. They understand that. Another big emotional connection that power users have with games is actually one of self-expression. It's, uh, it's pretty low on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, being able to express yourself. And that actually comes out in games, too. We've seen two different kinds of, of people who like expressing themselves. One are the people who want to be something part of something larger than themselves, like my concert fans and my football fans. They want to be part of a large, successful, popular team. Then there are the people who really kind of like more like the Navy SEALs or the Delta operators. Man, these guys are high speed, low drag. They want to be part of a clan that is super good at something because they want to be the best and they want to be recognized for it. They want to be part of an elite team. Think about how your app interacts with these two emotional requirements of players. If you're appealing to neither of these, chances are low that you've got a huge power user base in your app because that's a really basic connection is being able to you know, feel elite or feel like a part of something larger. And that's why the talk we had on clans yesterday in this, um, in this room was super valuable and important because that actually helps fulfill some of those needs. Another basic need that people have is knowing that they're good at something and being acknowledged for it. Actually, one of the best examples I've seen of this isn't the game at all. It's TripAdvisor. You guys have used TripAdvisor, right? You know about TripAdvisor? Everybody give me a nod. Okay, if you're awake, give me a nod. Okay, thank you. Um, TripAdvisor makes me feel wonderful because you know what? On TripAdvisor, I'm the number one reviewer of fast food restaurants in my small zip code. Yeah, go Mike. And if I work really hard, I might be the number one restaurant reviewer in Seattle someday, or maybe the number one reviewer, period, in Washington someday. So here I am, Mike, I'm a reviewer, I'm a participant in, in TripAdvisor, and they find a level low enough where I'm pretty close to the top. And then that's what they show me, and that's what they send me mail on. And I'm feeling good, because if I just do a few more reviews, man, I'll be at the top of that level, and then they'll show me the next one up. And I've got something to work for because I'm already near the top of the leaderboard at that next level. So I'm always feeling good about my performance and the next level is always within reach. If you're showing people that there are 22,804 out of worldwide participants in your game, actually that's as depressing as it is encouraging, isn't it? So show them the context where they're actually really successful, and you'll generate a much better emotional response from your players. Generate a better emotional response from your players, you'll actually get more power users in the game. And it's by understanding how you guys can foster and respond to those basic human emotional requirements that are going to help people have a really good feeling after they enjoy the great game mechanic and game loop that you've engineered. Okay, nothing is going to excuse you from building a good game loop and, and, a, and, and a good experience. That's kind of the, the cost of getting in. But once you've developed that solid core game loop, help people feel really good about what they've done in the game and how they're going to do in the future. Now, what can you do before, during, and after launching your game, more specifically, that'll help generate some of these things? Well, while you're designing your game, Foster early engagement. Apptentive has found that you can increase retention a significant amount by communicating directly with your customers. And by directly with your customers, I mean finding ways that you can participate with them in chat rooms, on Facebook sites, uh, that you can create special events for them like... Um, Hey, uh, this Saturday, there's a dungeon crawl, and, and you can win a special purple Vorpal sword if you beat the boss on the special Saturday level. And people can engage with that and feel special for participating. Second is messaging people at the right time. If your game loop is really good, 
Your players are in a state of flow. They are super engaged in your game. They don't want to be disturbed. Now is the wrong time to message them about buying a t-shirt from you. Okay, wait until they're done with that game loop experience and they're no longer in a state of flow and then message them. That's going to help keep them feeling good and keep them uh, engaged longer. Now, keeping them engaged in the app is really important. And so if you've ever done level optimization, like difficulty level optimization, one of the things I want you to optimize for is next level start. I don't care about optimizing for in-app purchase value. As a matter of fact, if you do that, that's a bad idea. People will feel treated like an ATM. I want you to optimize for next level start to increase the amount of time people spend in the game and to get them coming back. And absolutely use server-side accounts for your player status so that they can play on any device they have handy, anywhere they are, and pick up right where they left off. Now, during the game, it's really important that you understand how you attach to these different aesthetics that people are going to. For example, I need to express myself. Let me have a custom skin for my avatar or for my character. Let me choose different backgrounds or, or different soundtracks to play to. Give me ways to up my ability. If I'm one of these elite Delta Force, special forces kinds of players, give me a way to, to boost my power. Sell me power-ups. Give me things that make me stronger, better faster. Um, let me express my status, how good I am, you know, the whole trip advisor ranking thing. And give me a chance to express my desire to collect things and hold collections. Um, Candy Crush taught us about um, money for time. When you, when you played Candy Crush for the first time, you enjoyed it, you played it for a while, and then they said, <laughs> and imagine how brave it must have been, how much risk they were taking when they said, we're going to find people who like our game and tell them they can't play anymore. How stupid is that, right? You love the game, so stop playing unless you pay a dollar? Well, actually, people like me, well, I didn't want to pay a dollar because I didn't like it that much, so I dropped off the end. But you know what? I was one of the guys down here. When, P when they lost players, they lost players from this end. They didn't lose players from up here. What happened was when they said, if you want to keep playing, you need to pay a dollar, the people who really, really loved Candy Crush paid lots and lots of dollars to keep playing. It turned out that that was a brilliant business move, even though it must have been incredibly risky for them to try that in the first place. So um, good on them for, for taking that chance. And then price distribution. Um, price distribution I want to dive into a little bit more. Um, take a look at the graph. There are a bunch of pairs of, of bars here. The one on the left is where we have most of our catalog. And by we, I mean most of us in the Amazon App Store. When you take a look at the apps, we have like 31 and 29% of our catalogs are at 99 cents and $1.99. Unfortunately, it's the bar next to it that reflects how much money we make. And guess where that is? Yeah, that's over on the right-hand side, isn't it? That's over at $49 and $99, where we're making a lot of our revenue. But we have almost none of our selection over there in our in-app purchase catalogs. The top 50 games in the Amazon App Store do a much better job of balancing their catalogs with where they earn their money. So I want you guys to take a look at how many options you have at the high end of your IAP catalogs and absolutely make sure that that's more balanced than it probably is right now. Now, after your game is in the market, I want you to recognize a couple of things that's gonna take to grow with your customers. First of all is the price sensitivity of your items. Now, this is a really important thing we found looking at the Amazon App Store. After a player has been in your game for 30 days, they are probably likely to spend 60% more on an in-app purchase item than they were at day one. If you're showing your customers the same IAP catalog at day 30 that you showed them at day one, you're hurting your power users by not giving them what they want to buy, and that means you're leaving money and customer satisfaction on the table, which doesn't do anybody any good. So think about that. Now, while you're expanding your catalog, uh, I want you to make sure that you, you keep it fresh, too. Now, a big catalog in the Amazon App Store almost always means that app is making more money. Now, this could be an easy graph to misinterpret. Just because you have 15 items in your catalog means you make more money than if you have six. 
the apps that are doing well don't show all 15 at once. That would be a disastrous dialogue, wouldn't it? Can you imagine trying to show 15 different things at once on an app purchase catalog? Um, No, what they're doing is they're using the depth of this catalog so that they can show day one users one part of that catalog, and the catalog is deep enough so that for day 30 users, they can show them a different 60% more expensive part of that catalog. And that's where a deep catalog really comes in handy and helps a lot. Uh, Next thing is distribution of price points. While variety and options and choices is good, variety of price points can confuse people. If you've got a sword for $1, $2, and $3, what's the difference really? And a confused user who doesn't understand the value doesn't buy the most expensive thing or the least expensive thing. They don't buy anything at all actually. So think about how you really clarify value and make that perfectly obvious to the user. And then treat all your customers as equal. Because remember, um, even if they're not a power user, they're probably advocates for you and influencers in very important circles. So make sure you don't forget about everybody else out there who's really valuable. Now, how can Amazon help you accomplish a lot of this? Well, one, Well, um, we've actually got a great customer base, so releasing on the Amazon App Store gives you access to those people. It also gives you access to 236 countries and territories around the world where the App Store is not only on our own branded devices like the tablets and Fire TV, but we're also the default store on BlackBerry devices, and we're pre-installed on a bunch of third-party Android devices from T-Mobile, Verizon, and uh, Orange. One of the particularly cool things that I'm really proud about about working for Amazon is not only do we support the the more traditional three monetization mechanics, ads, in-app purchasing, and premium, but we also innovate new monetization techniques. For example, Amazon Underground, where we will actually pay you for every minute that every customer is in your game. So if you've got a game that just can't attract power users and you still get a lot of usage time, maybe consider getting paid per minute. Um, we'll also make t-shirts for you because if you know your fan's not gonna wear that Seattle Seahawks jersey, they might as well wear a t-shirt with your game art printed on it. We'll go ahead and we'll make t-shirts for you um, at our cost. We won't charge you anything out of pocket. We'll put it up on the Amazon app store so that it looks like everything else on Amazon. And when someone buys a shirt, we'll take our cost out of the price of the shirt and send you guys a check for the rest. So uh, we're looking to help developers make more money in lots of different ways. So what do I want you to do? I want you to support your power users' emotional choices, all of your users' emotional choices, so that they can become really engaged, love what you're doing, love how they feel when they play your game, and so that they want to spend more money. I also want you to grow with them so your catalog stays fresh. Um, I want you to make sure that you analyze your metrics accordingly so that you don't have any of the big gaps or big holes because you're not considering the distribution of that revenue. Um, And basically, if you can keep those things in mind, I think you'll have a better chance of getting more power users and actually keeping the ones that you have happier. I know I've just dumped a whole bunch of information on you in about 31 minutes. If you want to learn more about uh, different ways to monetize, I'd be happy if you went to Bitly Indie Underground to learn more about getting paid for every minute. If you like the t-shirt idea, go to merch.amazon.com. If you want to find out in about 90 seconds how easy is it to get access to those customers on the Amazon App Store I talked about, go to Bitly App Store App Testing, and it'll show you exactly what you do or most likely don't have to do to your game in order to get it published on the Amazon App Store. Thank you so much.